After decades taking big corporations public, Sarah Hanks started CrowdCheck to help earlier stage companies raise capital through investment crowdfunding. Sarah is one of the leading legal experts on the Jobs Act and crowdfunding regulations. She's helped dozens of founders raise tens of millions of dollars through regulations A, D, and CF. For a legal 101 on equity crowdfunding, listen on. Sarah, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, maybe you could start by giving us an introduction. Who is Sarah Hanks and what is CrowdCheck? Okay. Well, I'm uh, a corporate and securities lawyer who's practiced for a number of years, but lost my mind and got interested in uh, crowdfunding. Um, <laughs> we uh, CrowdCheck, uh, together with its affiliated law firm, which is CrowdCheck Law, uh, we provide a, a range of legal compliance, disclosure, and due diligence services uh, for companies who are raising money online. It's a complete set of services pretty much anything you need um, if you're doing an online offering. And what are some of those uh, services, some examples? So, for, for example, if it's a Reg D offering, we can do defilings. Uh, in a Reg CF offering, we can help with the disclosure. We can uh, work with a company who is working with a platform like WeFunder to make sure that um, it uh, complies with all the requirements of the platform and the law. And basically do a lot of uh, hand-holding, um, which, and those services could include some legal advice, they could include some drafting assistance, uh, or anything that the company needs. Same thing for uh, Regulation A. Um, our most popular service for Regulation A is a complete uh, soup to nut service that includes the SEC filing, all of the legal advice, all of the disclosure, uh, all of the state notice filings, and um, uh, and also a due diligence report so that the company can show that it's, uh, it is who it says it is and it's doing what it says it's doing. Uh, and then uh, all of those services are also available on a sort of a la carte menu basis as well. So whatever you need, we can provide it. Love it. Um, you're one of the leading legal experts on the Jobs Act. Um, how did you get excited about this new way of raising money, equity crowdfunding? Um, and decide to focus on this space? Yeah, well, for, for many years, I was a partner in uh, a large law firm, one of the biggest law firms in the world. Um, I was a partner for a couple of decades. I was doing big IPOs and multi-billion uh, dollar IPOs, mostly for non-US companies. Um, and I loved that work, and I loved my team, and I loved the clients, but we were solving the same problem every day. There was nothing new. It was just the same issues with a different company name. Um, so um, in the uh, financial crisis, uh, I went to Capitol Hill uh, and helped uh, with the, I was general counsel of the uh, Congressional Oversight Panel overseeing TARP. And when uh, that wound up, I didn't really want to go back to doing exactly the same thing uh, as I'd been doing before. And I started to get interested in the uh, legal challenges that were, um, implicit in the Jobs Act, which was just going through Congress at that time. Uh, and looking at those and going, well, that's an interesting problem, and huh. maybe we can solve that problem. So one of the uh, needs that we identified issue, uh, um, early in these days, is, um, and that's what we started CrowdCheck with, uh, was due diligence, just um, giving um, some kind of um, good housekeeping seal of approval with respect to companies who were raising uh, funds online. Um, that kind of expanded as the various Jobs Act ex uh, exemptions came online. And uh, pretty soon we had to include legal services. Um, the uh, founders of CrowdCheck are all securities lawyers, and we kept being asked legal questions, and eventually we're like, yeah, we do actually have a license to provide <laughs> legal advice. <laughs> So we could charge money for this because up till then we were just being paid in chocolate. I mean, literally chocolate. <laughs> People were fed yeah. of chocolate. Um, so we founded the law firm to, to back up the, um, the, the services that CrowdCheck uh, was providing um, and started uh, charging fiat currency, although we will still consider chocolate in some sort of <laughs> Yeah, good to know. Uh, next time we collaborate on supporting the We Fund the Founder, uh, it, it has I'll to be know good. what... Yeah, good Californian chocolate. 
Well, I was going to say Cadbury's because that's an English accent, right? Well, uh, yes, it is. Originally, yes, it is. As you can identify. It's uh, it's funny. We've got two English people here um, saving the American dream together. Well, that that's what we have to do, right? We see a need, <laughs> so we come over and fix things. <laughs> Um, so maybe you could help um, summarize. The, there's a lot in the Jobs Act. Can you summarize mm-hmm. um, some of the key uh, legal changes um, that that brought about? Sure. The um, the things I'll focus on are the um, the changes that relate to to crowdfunding specifically, online capital formation, because the Jobs Act's got some other stuff that uh, tries to encourage uh, early stage companies which uh, can include companies with uh, revenues up to about a billion dollars, so a bit larger than the ones we generally <laughs> deal with. Yeah. But the, the ones that we deal with, um, primarily the, the Jobs Act um, uh, addressed a number of different exemptions from registration. And what I mean here is, in general, um, if you are making an offering of securities in the United States, that offering has to be registered with the SEC and go through all of their um, reviews and filing and all of that stuff. And and can you Uh, go into a little bit more detail on that for a second? When you say registration with the SEC, because you hear that a lot, registration with the SEC, oh, that's such a burden. But Mm -hmm. why why is that a burden? Why is that onerous for an early stage company? It's it's because... um, the, the disclosure that the SEC is looking for is, is really pretty elaborate. You can divide it into um, two general buckets. So information about the business and the company, uh, which, uh, even though it's expensive, you know, it takes a while to, to put all of that together, even though some of it may be kind of uh, obvious. The more complicated part, of course, is um, financial um, disclosure, and that can get very expensive. And um, one of the things that small companies going through the registration process with the SEC find uh, is that the SEC will frequently make you go back and change your um, financial statements because they don't agree with the way that, say, revenue recognition has been been recorded. And so uh, you have uh, a fairly big, um, (coughs) excuse me, a fairly big uh, regulatory um, lift in order to put together that disclosure uh, and answer all of the SEC's questions. You've also got the uh, the complications of while you're going through that process, there are quiet periods. There are rules about what you can say and when you can say it and who you can say it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once you are, once you've got your your IPO registered with the SEC, once they've signed off and um, made the offering effective, then you have ongoing reporting requirements, which includes financial statements that have to be uh, filed every quarter, uh, proxy statements. The insiders of the company have to file uh, statements about how much they own, and if they change that at any time. They have to file mm. more forms. So you're talking about like a whole pile of forms. Yeah, that, lots of that, forms basically <laughs> with the yeah. SEC registration. What, exactly. How, can you can you make it tangible in, in number? Like to 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 you know for for a relatively early company to register with the SEC, the one time cost, and then an mm-hmm. ongoing maybe annual annual cost of the the legal and financial cost you'll incur and and doing ongoing reporting. What are we what are we talking about here? Twenty K, fifty K? Oh, you you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, uh, even mm-hmm. with um providers like CrowdCheck, because we've moved into the registered space now. Um mm-hmm. and one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to, to provide uh, a a right priced uh service for, for registered companies, small registered companies, even with uh, uh, people like us, um there is still an enormous amount, uh, um, the, the, the costs of registration are huge. So for example, um, you are unlikely to be able to get through the initial IPO without, like I say, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm talking about these sort of, mm-hmm. you know, more than half a million dollars probably, especially when you put together the um, legal and accounting fees. And then uh, even the smaller companies who frequently complain to the SEC, uh, the, the, the SEC is very um, 
attuned to, to this constant complaint where um, a company will come and say, uh, it costs me $250,000 a year just to comply with your rules, even when I'm not raising well, funds, just to file your forms every year. Got it. Uh, so so, so yeah, SEC it's registration, very, very expensive to be avoided for most early stage startups. So um, then how did the 2012 Jobs Act um, help to you know, create new exemptions or modify existing mm-hmm. exemptions to uh, make it easier for or, or provide alternative avenues for startups to raise capital? Right. So, so what, uh, what the Jobs Act did is it, um, it created, in effect, three completely new exemptions. It modified the uh, existing private placement exemption, which was under Regulation D, if you sold only to accredited investors and you didn't advertise, no general solicitation, as it's called, so nothing on the Internet, uh, only talking to people you already knew, um, they took that that one and said, okay, now you can actually uh, solicit. You can go out there, you can use the internet to uh, raise funds and and attract new investors. And the uh, price for doing that is you must make sure that the investors are in fact accredited investors. So that was taking an old exemption and just supercharging it for the 21st century to be able to use modern means of communication. So that's number one, but it's still accredited only. Uh, the other two exemptions. Uh, and what's the variant? What's the variant of that reg- regulation D exemption? Yeah, that's 506C. Um, 506B is what used to be regulation D, uh, um, and that's the one that said you know, no um, uh, no advertising. So you private can still use. Private solicitation only. Yeah, yeah, you can use 506B, but it's completely private. And now we've got regulation 506C. Um, so the, uh, the other uh, exemptions, um, primary exemptions, are Regulation A and Regulation CF. Yes. Um, regulation A has actually existed forever. It's been around since the 1930s. Um, it was a sort of um, lighter review exempt public mm-hmm. offering. You can make an offer to the public. You can use general solicitation. You're not restricted on who you can sell to. It doesn't have to be accredited. Uh, but under the old rules, um, it wasn't used very much. Um, it had a million dollar limit, um, and then the, then it was a five million dollar limit. Um, and it also uh, required that you go through state review uh, in every state that you were offering in, which is extraordinarily expensive because some states practice what is called merit review. And that means uh, that the state will decide whether this is a good investment or not. You know, uh, mm-hmm. They will say, do you, do you have independent directors? Okay, if you don't, you can't sell in our state. So um, the, the two big things that uh, the Regulation A rules did, uh, the revised Regulation A, and, and people like to call it now Regulation A+, plus. that's a cute nickname. Uh, but the two things it did was um, make a larger amount. So now offerings up to $50 million dollars. Um, can be made under Regulation uh, A, and the SEC preempted state review. The states did not take kindly to that, and, and they sued the SEC. Uh, but the SEC really? Won. Oh, they did. Yeah. I did not know this. Wow, this is it's getting uh, salacious now. <laughs> yes. Tell us more well, about that. Well, in fact, one, one of the uh, whenever the SEC changes it rule, its rules, it has to um, propose them for public comment, and one of the public comments. Uh, came from the state regulators and started with the words shame exclamation mark. Uh, wow. so, yes, Very game yes, of thrones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there were, thank God there were no, no naked securities regulators. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, you are making um, securities more sexy on this podcast, <laughs> which is an impressive feat, but you're achieving which, it. Keep going. Yeah, which, is, which is terrifying, actually. <laughs> Right. So, so uh, yeah, there, there was a lawsuit um, and the SEC won. And so now Regulation A, uh, you can do uh, offerings up to $50 million. Um, you still have to be reviewed by the SEC, but not by uh, the state. And, and it's and not a people, merit review. Exactly. Um, one thing that people might say, well, hey, what about that, you know, tier one thing? Um, uh, that... Uh, Regulation A comes in two flavors, Tier 2 and Tier 1. Tier 2 is by far the more um, popular one. 
Uh, tier two says you can raise up to $20 million. There are no ongoing reporting requirements, unlike tier two. Um, but the, uh, the price you pay for that is that you have to be reviewed by the state that you're offering in. And that can be, um, it doesn't work for all companies, especially mm -hmm. early stage operating companies. And when you say ongoing reporting requirements for um, tier two Reg A plus, where you can raise up to 50 million, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before uh, SEC registration has on ongoing uh, reporting requirements. I presume the Reg A plus ongoing reporting requirements are lighter. Um, mm -hmm. But but then, you know, how much is a company going to spend every year on those ongoing reporting requirements? And can you talk about what they still need to do and some of the ways in which it's sure. lighter than the full SEC registration? Yeah, it is. It's much lighter in that there's no quarterly reporting, only semi-annual. Uh, the, uh, the filing due dates are much um, it, less onerous than would be for a registered company. So by the end of April, you have to file audited financial statements together with uh, an update um, telling the, uh, the SEC and the world at large how the uh, company has developed, how business is doing uh, since it last filed. Um, if you were okay with the, uh, the first round of Reg A, you'll be okay with the ongoing reporting because it, it's less burdensome. Um, but that has to be filed by uh, the end of April. Uh, by the end of September, and I'm assuming here you know, this is a calendar year company, uh, by the end of September you have to file June interim financial statements not needing to be reviewed, not needing to be audited. The mm -hmm. management can produce those. Uh, and then if anything important happens in the company's lifetime uh, during that time, like for example you fire your auditors, or the CEO died, um, that actually sadly did actually happen to us. Um, wow. So anything important like that, uh, you need to file a Form 1U, which is very short. It can just say, you know, sadly, the CEO is deceased now, and so-and-so is taking over. Um, so um, it's, a, a much, it's a much lighter lift, um, and it also should be commensurately cheaper. Uh, you know, uh, companies like CrowdCheck, we provide an annual um, fixed fee um, service for doing that. Uh, and the, uh, the auditing costs are similarly uh, much cheaper than they would be for, for the, uh, the registered offerings. On average, can you throw out a number of what, what a company is going to be paying to, to do the Tier 2 Reg A Plus reporting requirements annually? Um, the, the, uh, the, the auditing one is the more difficult one because it is going mm -hmm. to vary you know, company by company. If, the, if it's a REIT that hasn't done anything, hasn't deployed any of its funds, then you, know, you should be able to get away with a few thousand dollars. Um, but a company that's been doing a lot of things and maybe even making an acquisition, if you make an acquisition, mm -hmm. you're going to have to show the acquired company's uh, financials. So it can vary tremendously from the... Um, uh, point of view of uh, the accounting. Legal, uh, we charge uh, $25,000, and that includes um, everything that needs to be filed with the SEC, plus uh, ongoing handholding and, um, uh, and, and, and filing advice. Got it. So, um, so we've covered Regulation D, how the JOBS Act um, unlocks uh, 506C, which allows startups to generally solicit um, from accredited investors. Um, using um, a platform like AngelList um, or WeFunder. Um, we've covered Regulation A+, plus, um, or the updates to the Regulation A um, exemption that now allows startups to raise up to $50 million, um, with a um, federal uh, review that isn't, isn't a merit review. Um, so that brings us uh, neatly to Regulation Crowdfunding. What's that yep. all about? Yeah, so regulation crowdfunding, unlike the other two exemptions, was a completely new exemption. Uh, and there had been, uh, if you go back and look at what was happening in Congress at the time, there, there were fighting versions of uh, regulation CF um, that got put into the, uh, the Jobs Act, that there was one super light touch uh, version uh, that started off in, in the legislation, got pulled out by the Senate. The Senate put its own version in um, and then sent it back to the, uh, to the House to be voted on. The House being faced with, uh, you know, take it or leave it, you've got to vote uh, in favor of this slightly 
um, more regulated version of RegCF went ahead and voted for it. It was very interesting from, from the point of view of uh, parliamentary procedure, uh, but it did mean that uh, the version of RegCF that ended up in the Jobs Act was the more um, prescriptive, shall we say, of, of the variants that, uh, that had been drafted. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, what uh, what was adopted and which is still in effect is um, uh, you can do an offering up to a million dollars, uh, which has now been um, inflation adjusted to one point zero seven million dollars. Um, it is um, filed with the SEC, but not reviewed by them, so it goes uh, effective immediately upon filing, um, and uh, yeah, it can be used uh, by uh, any U.S. companies. Um, for um, a, a, a fairly um, fairly light regulatory lift, and which of course is uh, is helped by the the way that the platforms like you guys uh, create a um, a template for um, for making disclosure, which is um, an important way that um, uh, non accredited investors who who's, who who are dealing with here can uh, compare the various uh, investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. that was a completely new one. Yeah, and and just this is an aside, but regulation CF makes sense, regulation crowdfunding. Um, what happened to regulation B and C? Why is it, why is it regulation D? Do you know? Yeah, the, the, in the early days, when you, you go you go back. Um, Got it. So there was a B yeah. and C, and then there was a D. There was. There was, Got yeah. It. The Some of them just stand for something. No, no. There are other regulations that do stand for stuff. For for example, Regulation F. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> All right. So, um, from your legal perspective, um, what would you say to a founder who's considering running a, a regulation crowdfunding campaign, um, or potentially a regulation A plus? But actually, maybe let's focus on the Reg C F side. Um, what what are some of the pros and cons, the legal pros and cons to, to founders of raising capital through this exemption? Uh, through, through Regulation A. For, through Regulation okay. Crowdfunding, sorry. Crowd, crowdfunding, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, if you're doing a, a Reg CF, I mean, the, the, uh, the pros, obviously, yeah, you can raise money. Uh, you can raise money um, pretty fast. Um, but, um, and, and you can do it without... Uh, getting uh, venture capitalists uh, involved. I mean, it, it is very much a uh, democratization of the the, um, the fundraising process. And we've had companies say to us uh, so many times, I, I talked to the venture capitalists and that they wanted a huge stake, but more importantly, um, it was the involvement of the venture capitalists uh, that bothered the companies. They, they didn't understand my business. They didn't understand the way I wanted to do things. I was going to give up everything. And they maybe had different uh, long-term objectives. The name. Ex yeah, ex exactly. I mean, uh, you know, VCs are like, well, we want to be out of this in five, five to seven years. <laughs> yeah. uh, whereas uh, the thing about uh, crowdfunding is you, you're looking for your crowd. You're looking for your own tribe. Um, and you want to be, you want them to be part of uh, of, of your future success, um, and so that's one of the, the the reasons that many companies have given us for wanting to just skip the whole VC thing and raise money. Um, you still got flexibility with uh, respect to um, being able to raise capital in the future. That it does not close off. Uh, those options, and in fact, in the early days, we we kept being told. Um, venture capitalists will never touch anybody who uh, has raised funds through um, through equity crowdfunding. And that's actually turned out not to be accurate. There are some venture capitalists who say, well, this is proof of, uh, proof of concept. Are you, uh, we're not going to invest in you until you prove that other people uh, think this is a good enough idea. So go out, find, find your affinity, find, find your group. Um, well, we we always talk about how um, ultimately um, most VCs that are worth their salt are going to be investing in a company that's growing uh, like a rocket ship and um, you know has incredible uh, potential to print money uh, in the coming years, um, much much um, above how clean the cap table is. Yeah, yeah, 
and and the the the, the cap table thing is a, a kind of interesting thing because you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because a lot of people say we don't want to have a messy cap table it's like well why do you not want a messy cap table because mm-hmm. you can just have a cap table that says other which includes you know five thousand or, or more investors Mm. Um, and also, you have you have the ability to have uh, instruments, you know, like the the, the safe that you guys use frequently, uh, that don't um, result in people having an equity stake that they have to be voting on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that that's a way that uh, a lot of companies have gotten around that this whole you know we're we're, we're scared of the messy cap table. Uh, one thing that we would like to see, I think all of us would like to see the ability to use special purpose vehicles in right. in all forms of crowdfunding. Which the Jobs Act 3.0, um, if and when it passes the Senate, it passed the House 406 okay. before last year. We hope it passes the Senate soon. That would make that change, which I agree would be would be beneficial. It would. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I have no faith in anything happening. That's one of one thing that uh, it's a bipartisan. Um, it was bipartisan right. in the House. Uh, it could be bipartisan in the Senate. Uh, look, if you want a bipartisan win, just pass the damn thing. But no, mm-hmm. um, I don't think it's going to happen. But one of politics, the things, based, Sarah. Oh God, yeah, politics. One of the things that might happen is uh, that the SEC might pre- end up preempting them and uh, and making changes mm-hmm. ahead of um, ahead of them. That there is, uh, as as we all know, the SEC put out this uh, concept release saying, "Hey, we got all of these exemptions, and they're all completely different from each other. And how about we harmonise them? And what else do you want us to change at the same time?" Uh, and so, uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I threw into the comment letter is, please, oh, just special purpose yeah. vehicles. It would be so and easy. And Nick, too. Our CEO, Nick, yep. uh, wrote, oh, yeah. a, wrote a great letter in response to the SEC there as well. Yeah, I mean, the thing with SPV, for me, it, it benefits um, investors because yeah. they can they now have kind of more more power kind of collectively than they, they would individually. So, um, it's you know, founders want it. it. I feel like it's better for investors, too. It seems yep. like a no-brainer. Um, yeah, um, but you, I was interested by what you said. What, you know, why don't you want a, a messy cap table? I mean, you know, to your point, you, you don't have to worry about um, voting rights um, with with um, or most companies will, will, will kind of not worry about that with how they structure the we fund uh, investment contracts. What are the other concerns that founders raise to you about? A long cap table. Are there are there valid ones in there? What are some of the other ones which might be, you know, a perceived concern which um, doesn't actually, you know, shouldn't actually matter as much as people might think. Yeah, I think um, you know, part of the the, uh, the issues with respect to to the the cap table in general is um, the ability to handle a large number of investors. I and mean, this is one of the things that we always say when we're talking to a company that's planning crowdfunding is um, these people are going to be talking to you all the time. They are going to say, I am a shareholder and I believe that you are doing this wrong. You know, um, you're a muffin shop. You should be selling cinnamon nut muffins instead of chocolate chip. You are an app developer. You should be developing for this phone and not that phone. Um, people are going to be talking to you. And, of course, they are shareholders. Um, uh, in in many cases, it, it depends on you know, whether you use shares or safe or or, or crowd or whatever. Yeah. But you, they are going to talk to you, and you've got to have a way of uh, responding to them. Otherwise, they are going to be mad at you, and you took their money. So it's only fair that they might want to ask you questions. Uh, so that's one issue. Uh, that's well, I I, I usually thing. flip that because for me, you know, you're getting feedback all the time from customers as well. Right, yeah. and so you need a mechanism to to deal to to respond to customers and also investors. But at the end of the day, you know you can see that as a as a burden and and a and a downside. And obviously there is a cost to that that you should you should consider. But you can also see it as an incredible way to you know um, engage an army of champions, uh, people that care about your business and are so excited about your business that they invested their own money uh, in helping you to, to raise the capital you mm-hmm. need. And you can turn that into a huge, a tremendous asset for the, for the business, you know, whether it's giving you product feedback, um, whether solicited or unsolicited, or whether it's, you know, turning them into um, brand ambassadors and helping you 
promote a new product that you released on, on social media or tell all their friends or buy it for all their friends at, at holidays or whether it's, you know, sharing a job description of an engineer that you're trying to hire on their LinkedIn profile. So, you know, you, you can see that as a burden, but I think the companies for whom regulation crowdfunding and raising from the crowd makes the most sense actually flip that and see that as a tremendous asset. The other thing I would, I would say, I honestly, the vast majority, I, I'm interested by what you said because it maybe implies you've you've heard different things from founders that have that have done this. The vast majority of founders that I've spoken to don't say that this is a big pain. Actually, I think they have this perception coming in, maybe because you're setting their expectations in that way. <laughs> but they they have this kind of perception coming in, and then you know, there's, obviously, there's questions in the campaign. There's a lot of questions and answers during the campaign, but subsequently, I feel like often they the, the feedback I'm getting generally is this isn't too much work to manage these investors. Is that different to what you've heard from founders? No, no, I think it's, I, I mean, it's a, that's a really good way of putting it, actually, is, is um, you know, communications are not uh, a problem. They, they are, it's, it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature of crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, the bottom line is you've got... Um, uh, however you treat these, and, and I think you're right. This can be it can be tremendously positive, but you have to have a way, uh, a channel for listening uh, and responding. Because if people are ignored, um, a obviously, as you say, that you're you're losing the important information that they could give you, and b they they don't like being ignored. So just the the bottom line, I think, is. Um, know that there will be communications, welcome them, as you say, uh, but have a way, have, you, have somebody who will actually respond to questions and communications that come in. Mm -hmm. and, and consider future financing as well. Uh, we've oh, had yeah. several companies on WeFunder that, you know, have done repeat raises. After their first raise, they didn't do a great job on saving investors. And then in the second raise, lo and behold, they struggle to raise the money. And then conversely, we've had companies that do an incredible job regularly updating their investors. Um, I invested in uh, one company, My Swim Pro, um, that did a raise on WeFunder, I think, back in 2016. And they just did another one um, last year uh, or earlier this year. And uh, they've done an incredible job every month updating investors, asking for help. Um, and their second raise went very, very well. They raised a lot more money. And I think a part of that was they'd done such a good job of communicating uh, along the way. It, well, exactly. I mean, you know, never forget what the name of this uh, this industry is. It's crowdfunding. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you have a crowd. They are your guys. Go to mm -hmm. them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Keep, in, keep in touch. Yeah. So um, what legal advice might you have for founders that are considering or launching an equity crowdfunding campaign? And and kind of maybe part of that, are there, are there one or two nifty legal tricks that um, you might be able to share with uh, founders to, to help them out? Sure. Yeah, one of the things that we've really noticed, and, and, and it came as a kind of surprise to us, is that um, when we're dealing with uh, companies who are so early in their development, um, so many of them don't actually know uh, some of the corporate basics, like what is the difference between an officer and a director? What is the responsibility of a director? And we've, we have learned from our own clients by the questions they ask. Uh, so uh, for founders, I mean, um, uh, we are going to ask, and, and the, the, the funding um, portal is going to ask, who are your officers? Um, before, you, before you start answering that, uh, work out what the responsibilities are. Officers do management. They run things for the company. Uh, you have a CEO or a president who uh, is moving things forward. A CFO has responsible for, uh, uh, for the uh, financials and so forth. And then the directors, this is a fiduciary relationship. This is a, um, you know, somebody who is acting on behalf of the owners, the shareholders, um, and so appoints them carefully. For, for companies at this stage, you're never going to get independent uh, outside directors. It's just not a practical thing. Uh, but when you decide who's going to be a director, it's not just, you know, toss it up and, you know, Ashok, you get to be a CFO. Josh, you get to be the director. <laughs> um, and we have seen that. Um, so decide, um, you know, learn what those things mean uh, and uh, appoint people appropriately. Uh, and uh, bear in mind that as we see as we go through the due diligence, you know, 
sometimes people fall out and they leave and you know, make sure mm -hmm. that um, uh, when that happens, you, you, you take care of it um, in accordance with corporate law under which you've been organized. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, that uh, we've had to flag is uh, learn how securities are created. Uh, for one of the, the great things about SAFE, uh, for example, is that they are creatures of corporate, uh, of um, contract law as opposed to corporate. So uh, that means that uh, you aren't having to go to Delaware law and say, I am, I'm thinking of preferred shares and how do I, how do I create these things? It's just we enter into a contract. It's much simpler. When this happen, mm -hmm. when X happens in the future, then we will create the shares. Uh, but um, a lot of companies are out there with uh, share issuances, and we have literally had a conversation where we're like, okay, um, we're, um, we're, we're looking at your certificate of incorporation. You're a Delaware company. You seem to have only common shares, and you seem to have sold preferred shares. Can you explain to us what happened here? Mm. Uh, and the answer is, well, we had a board meeting. Right, and 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 we approved the essence of, of preferred shares. We're like, oh dear. Um, so, um, <laughs> and then we had to have a sort of birds and the bees discussion. It's like this is how securities are created. When 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 a company and an investor love each other very very much, they get together. <laughs> and <laughs> This is how the shares happen. Um, so you really do have to understand some corporate basics. Uh, it would be nice. Uh, and I'm speaking as a, as a business person as opposed to a lawyer here, it would have been nice if, if uh, crowdfunding could work without lawyers. But it's really hard. I mean, you really do need somebody who understands how things are created and documented. And, and by the way, the way that you create preferred shares is not just having a board meeting. It is having a board meeting and then making a filing with Delaware that says now we have preferred shares. Always so be you, closing it, Sarah. Always be closing. <laughs> yeah, Always so. pitching those founders on the need <laughs> for crowd check services. <laughs> yeah, so, you know you can't do without lawyers. You can't do without them uh, much as everybody uh -huh. would want to. But you can try uh -huh. and make it lawyer light as opposed to lawyer intensive. Well, um, that's that's a couple of great pieces of advice. Um, Thank you. Um, the, the last question that we ask all guests is um, not necessarily legal advice, but uh, one piece of advice. I mean, you, you started CrowdCheck, um, so you're, a, you're an entrepreneur as well as a lawyer. Um, what's, uh, what's your best piece of advice um, for a founder that's uh, uh, not just from a fundraising perspective, but, uh, you know, launching a company and uh, running a company more broadly? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I, I like the quote, you are the captain of your soul. You are in charge mm. of your journey. Uh, and one thing that you can never do is um, outsource your vision to somebody else, whether it's service providers, intermediaries, whoever. You, you founded this company with a view of where it was going to go and what it was going to do and why people would want it. Um, so always be have that have your mission in mind and don't um, don't spend a lot of time going to the service providers and like well i don't know what do you think i should do mm -hmm. <laughs> but those people will never be able to answer the, those questions uh, as effectively as the the person who founded the company well so so don't outsource it to, um, you know, drive your own ship I love it. What a great quote. You are the captain of your soul. That's a beautiful note to end on. Sarah, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you managed, I think, to make uh, crowdfunding uh, regulations, uh, parliamentary procedure, the law, uh, as interesting as humanly possible. So uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for, very much for doing that and coming on. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, one last thing, actually. Um, what uh, if folks want to um, get to know CrowdCheck, um, where do they go? CrowdCheck.com? Uh, yeah, it's just CrowdCheck.com, and I am Sarah, S-A-R-A, -A, uh, no H, uh, at CrowdCheck.com. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. We'll speak soon. All right. Thank you. Adventure Capital is brought to you by your fundraising team here at WeFunder. It consists of Johnny Price, Kieran Ryan, Justin Renfro, and myself, Oliver Foyahunt. Our cover artwork is done by WeFunder storyteller Yuri Choi, and we'll be sharing the adventures of founders every other week. 
If you have any comments, ideas, suggestions, or just want to say hi, don't hesitate to reach out at hello at wefunder.com. We'll see you next time. <laughs>